Welcome back to our sequence on the engineering design cycle. In this session, we will do a brief overview of basic principles in testing and evaluating an engineering design at the subsystem or system level. While there are far more approaches and strategies for evaluating whether systems work or don't work, there are some basic principles that can guide developing an appropriate way to test designs. Depending on the iteration of the design cycle, these tests may be simple early in the design cycle to determine whether the design holds promise for further development. Or, system testing may involve exploring the extremes of design operation to ensure that the design can withstand anticipated user and environmental conditions. This level of in-depth testing is more likely to occur in later design cycles for a particular engineering design. At this stage in the design cycle, we should have a complete prototype ready to test. In other sessions on the engineering design cycle, we have dis discussed strategy of how to test components of the system and to what degree and depth. Here, we move forward on the assumption that the main and supporting components of the design prototype have already been tested and the results fully documented and evaluated to verify that the components are indeed suitable for a particular design. While testing begins at the component level, it can be difficult to determine when testing will end. Some design teams will end too early believing or hoping that if the design works once, it is time to call it good and move on. Other design teams may be reluctant to stop testing, concerned that some corner of operation remains unexplored that is sure to spell doom and disaster for the engineering design. Regardless of what kind of team you belong to, some basic steps can be taken to ensure that enough testing is done prior to proceeding to a design review or other form of external evaluation. In this slide, we explore some examples of what subsystem testing may endeavor to accomplish. Although all of these examples come from sensor or environmental monitoring systems, any subsystem will be responsible for either producing an absolute output that can be measured using some form of test instrument, or generating a pattern that is sufficiently distinguishable from other patterns to provide a certain guarantee that the design works as promised. The last example here, an accelerometer where all three axes of force or acceleration are needed to determine the orientation of an object in space based on gravity's orientation, provides an absolute subsystem output. The output is the orientation relative to the Earth in degrees, radians, or some other unit along three axes. The accuracy of the system is measured as the difference between the actual orientation and the computed orientation from the system itself. And the precision is the variance in the orientation computed from the three axes under constant input conditions. Accuracy and precision here are absolute and not relative to another orientation in space. In contrast, the first system, which endeavors to identify good beer from bad beer, a very worthy endeavor, uses the output of multiple sensors to identify a good pattern of beer compared to a bad pattern. The functionality of the system is not measured in an absolute sense but rather by evaluating how often good beer is indeed recognized by the system and as good beer, and how often it is mistaken for bad beer. And the same for bad beer samples. Testing and evaluating subsystems or systems of a design at a fundamental level, then, begins with understanding whether it is an absolute measurement we are seeking to get or a more relative measurement that determines whether the design works or not. Let's take a look at what this testing looks like in a logic diagram, again using a sensor system as an example. 
As a reminder, we enter into this phase of testing, having tested both main and supporting components in the design. The first two phases of testing have tested each main sensor component in an isolated and controlled environment, and then in a controlled environment to not only verify but characterize and document the sensor's behavior. Once this component level testing is done, we can move on to a very basic level of subsystem or system testing. Does the design work in a typical and representative environment for the system? In the case of an airbag sensor system, this may involve testing the accelerometer in a moving vehicle. In the case of beer quality, described in the previous slide, this may involve testing of obviously good and known bad beer. But once these typical representative conditions are defined, we can proceed to evaluating whether the system is functional under those conditions. If it is, we are ready per to proceed to other subsystem or to testing the design or system under extreme operating conditions that may indeed threaten its failure. In the next two slides, we look at a single system and test it in the two different contexts we have discussed. Here, the three axis axes of an accelerometer are used to measure the orientation of a tennis racket relative to ground or relative to the hand or arm of the tennis player. These are absolute measurements that determine orientation within a certain number of degrees of accuracy. However, the same system could be used instead to evaluate functionally if the accelerometer provides sufficient information about the motion of the tennis racket to accurately identify a good swing and differentiate it from a bad swing. Same accelerometer, same three axes outputs, but the test of functionality of the design is entirely different. The first measures orientation as an absolute quantity. The second measures orientation as a quantity relative to good or bad swing. In this next example, we show the same concept of pattern detection as the function in a system for a biomedical design. The goodness or functionality of the system is measured in two ways. The number of false positives, in this case, how many individuals with no HIV infection are incorrectly determined to have HIV, and the number of false negatives, how many individuals with HIV infection are incorrectly determined to not have HIV. How important each type of error, false positives and false negatives, are is highly dependent on the application. In this example, we might imagine false negatives to be more of an issue, but this is not necessarily true and requires more knowledge of the application and ultimate market for this product to understand. In this brief overview, we have covered the stage of design testing that involves subsystems and systems. We discussed the need to first test subsystems under typical or representative operating conditions. If our design passes this phase of testing, we may choose to move on to testing the design in more extreme operating conditions to ensure that the design does not fail under anticipated extremes of temperature, humidity, pressure, and so on. Whether we proceed to this phase will depend on how early or how advanced we are in our iterations of the engineering design cycle. This concludes our introduction to subsystem and system testing during the test and evaluate phase of the engineering design cycle. Thank you for joining us. We certainly hope that this session has helped you and your team get started in testing and evaluating a design prototype at the system level and that you'll join us again as we take a detailed look at other phases of the design cycle.